Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Full Gospel Assembly Bible Studies. It is Wednesday, March the 16th, 2022. So welcome, everyone. I want to give a special thanks to my pastors, especially our under our shepherd from Full Gospel in Brooklyn, Michael Backus, and Pastor Jesse Passad. Thank you so much, and a, and a special thanks for this opportunity, for allowing me to share the word of God and to study it, to study together. So I want to say thanks for that. I appreciate you. And I also want to thank the ministerial staff, as well as the leadership from Full Gospel Assembly, and to you, the congregation, our friends, our friends and family, and whoever joins us, whoever stops and see us on YouTube, please welcome and join us and let's search the word of God like the Bible tells us the Berean did. Thank you for joining us today. I am looking forward to searching the word. Now, to continue, I, um, this is, uh, many of you know, this March is the month of uh, Women History Month. And our pastor wisely so chose for us to study the Proverbs 31 woman and her character and the traits that makes her a virtuous woman. So we are going to today, before I start, before we begin, I would like us to pray and commit this time of study in God's hands. So let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity, this privilege that it is to search your word and to learn more of you and what you desire for us to be and to do in our walk with you. So now, Father, I ask of you that you open up my understanding, give me wisdom, knowledge, that I can understand what your word is saying, that the Holy Spirit will impart in me so I can in turn impart in others, that we can learn together so we can grow together in the name of Jesus. And now, Father, take preeminence, take complete control of this study. God, let your word be in my mouth. You put your word in my mouth as I open it, Father. Help me, Lord, to find the right words to say, the right scriptures to apply, so that we can understand what your word is saying. Now, we thank you, Father, for another day, because this, again, your word said, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad. So I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Now, use everything that you have imparted in me so I can impart unto your people. I give you praise and thanks. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. So... I am going to study tonight, yes, I will go, I will refer to Proverbs 31, the woman in the Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. And if you're a Christian, or maybe even not, but you probably have heard about her, because this is a very, um, it's, this woman is used as a measuring stick for the, the character, her character as a Christian. But I have to say that if you haven't heard about her, you have to be acquainted with her, but she comes across as perfect. Now, we know there is no one perfect but God. There is no one perfect, only he is. So tonight, what I'm gonna call this, my study, is I'm gonna take a look at the, the godly and the not so godly characters and the women in the Bible. So I'm gonna make a, I cannot compare the, the Proverbs 31 woman because she's, her character is uncomparable. And so for that purpose, I'm going to contrast her to other women in the Bible that they call, I found they said they call them the not so great eight women because of their flaws and their, and their contact, their, their ways, their character. So we're going to look at these other women and we're first we'll look at the Proverbs 31, her character and what makes her such a, a tough act to follow. But I want to tell you and tell myself, so please give ourselves some grace, right? Because she's a tough act to follow. Indeed she is. So let's give ourselves grace because it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that any one of us 
can either male or female. And this is why it's important to understand that her virtues, her qualities are not necessarily female qualities only. They apply to both men and women. So let's not say, oh, I cannot be what she is because it's, sex, it's, it's a, a bub, me. But it's a character that God, because we all striving and the purpose of this study, I am trying to put it in the light that we can attain Christ-likeness. So rather than looking at ourselves and measuring ourselves uh, in performance to say, oh, she did that, she's that, so I cannot, because we're different times. So, and I would dare say that for a time like this, in this season, in this time, I would dare say in our, in our time that it will be very difficult because it's a different time we're living in for us to perform and do these things that she did. And we have to read the word to understand all these things that she did. But we're gonna look at the book of Proverbs in the context as a whole, not as the virtuous woman, the wife of King Lemuel, no. I am going to look at the, the book of Solomon, why these virtues apply, these virtues that she has, why do they apply and to the women in those times? So I believe what, um, what this whole, the, the entire study for me is to view, to use these, these, these characters to help us. And is to help us in God's timing. He will use these to mature us in Christ and bring us more into an intimate relationship, which will bear fruit. And this particular fruit, the virtuousness, all these different character traits that she has, these are fruit that the spirit will help us to bring forth as we learn more and more and study. So let's look at the book of Proverbs in the context in which this woman, these characters are presented to us. So I went a little bit to understand the interpretation of the Old Testament book of Proverbs. It needs to always, we need to always keep in mind the essence of the context of the book, right? What is the whole, the, the shell, the whole thing that is enclosed in this book. Proverbs is about a king. King Solomon, and King Solomon, his purpose is prepare his son Rehoboam for kingship. So he's preparing him for political leadership over the nation. So it's in that narrow down context that I'm going to look at that character of the woman of Proverbs, the 31, Proverbs 31 women. So in those times, the king or state ruler uh, is selection of a wife. It was extremely important because if you're going to be a ruler in a nation, you have to be selective and careful who is your wife. So knowing this, because Solomon know that Rehoboam was a son of destiny, he wanted Rehoboam to find an excellent wife. Such a quest and attainment will be favorable in his eyes, King Solomon's eyes, and God's eyes. So that was his whole point. These traits are the ones he said, I need you to find. So therefore, a man need to choose, and what I, I'm going to give a, a Jewish word that I learned as I was studying, the Hebrew word is an excellent, it says, an excellent chayil, chayil, C-H-A-Y-I-L. So that Hebrew word, chayil, it means word of, it means valor. So she is a woman of valor, he means. That's the first thing that said, find a chayil, an excellent chayil, a woman of valor. Most time we read in the Bible about men of valor. We, we remember when we read I think it's Gideon, they call mighty men of valor. And so that word, we usually just use it and compare it to man. But women, we are women of valor. Yeah, we are mighty because what it means in that context is an elite, noble, in other words, with nobility and valiant. 
she's a wife. So that's Proverbs 31. Now we read on Proverbs 12 and 4, it tells us, and verse, and also Proverbs 31 and 10, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, a crown to her husband. And I be, and that's where I believe the word noble comes in. So she is a crown, but she that make it a shame is as rottenness in his bone. And that's and 31, verse chapter 31, verse 10 says, who can find a virtuous woman? So the Bible does not forget nor diminish the importance of a, a political leader's wife. That's what it is all about. You're going to go into politics. It's not like today, um, everyone goes into politics and you, uh, the family is a mess and you don't know. We've seen things and we heard of times where the wife is involved in some mess, the husband in some mess, but everybody goes into politics. But those days, the, who, the rulers over a nation had to be of a certain quality. Therefore, the Proverbs that talk about women in general, most specific relate to a woman. These uh, virtuous uh, character traits relate to a woman in Proverbs. And Proverbs speak a whole, about a whole lot of women, different women. So a woman that will be married to a governor, a, governor, a, a governing authority, forgive me, so it's in this context, in this insight, it explains why the Proverbs 31 woman is of highest caliber, why she needs to be excellent, and why she has to have higher standards. In the same way that uh, we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, there is a higher standard for a male leadership in the church. Just as Proverbs, there is a high standard to be set for a, high, for a woman that is a partner to a ruler of a state. So Timothy 3 speaks of the bishop, those called to preach to the church, the deacons. He says, the, it says in a, I'm going to read it because uh, I think I want to read a little bit. It says, the qualification of a Christian leader. This Chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire it a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filter lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. And I'm going to jump to verse 11 because that's where they mention the kind of wife that he should have. Even so, must their wives be grave, which means they're serious, be, con be controlled, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And he goes on saying, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. So we hear that. It's in the church, the standards for the church are pretty much the same character they're asking that the virtuous women in Proverbs have the body of the, the leaders in the church must have also. So um, these are qualities that God desires for every mother and daughter as a young woman, a married lady or a grandmother. What are the virtues of, of female godliness? What specific qualities should we continue to seek after and make them better? That's the question. How I get better with my patience? How I get better with my industriousness? How do I get better with my, my, my caretaking skills? How do I get better? Because Philippians 4, 8 reminds us these things, when you start thinking on these things, it says, finally, Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, who's, whatsoever things are true, I'm just going to read what they, every adjective, I'm not going to repeat the whole verse because it says, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there is any praise, think on these things. So Paul is speaking to the brethren that, and that means all of us. 
He said, finally, brethren, that mean men and women, all of us, finally, brethren, let's change our thinking. He's saying, think on these things. So mother and father, they're called to be trained their sons and daughters equally. Mothers and fathers, we are called to train our sons and daughters to have discernment regarding these godly virtues in a woman and even in a man. You're going to be a leader in the, in the church. And what follows is an outline of all that Proverbs states about this specific subject, as well as additional passages I'm going to add pertaining to the subject. So um, learn the characteristics of a great woman. And this is where we, Proverbs 31 comes in. She's industrious. And in verse chapter 14, verse one, it says the wise woman, this is not in 31, but I went to chapter 14. And it says the wise woman builds her house but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. 31, chapter 31, verses 24 to 25 says, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belt to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future, so optimistic. And so she so just, looks, just looks so happy, just know. What I'm doing is it's it's great thing. I'm building. I'm industrious, so I'm building. She looks chapter on the verse 31, 27 says she looks well to the ways of her household, first and foremost, or home, and does not eat the bread of idleness. All these proverbs condemn, or most of these proverbs condemn laziness, slothfulness, idleness. Certain cultures, especially in America, we see it a lot. It's increasingly becoming a culture of mindlessness where children don't want to exert mental and physical, like it's so hard to get them off the games. It's so hard to get them to focus and thinking. Even we're hearing right now critical theory and it's a whole lot of things because we are hindering our generation from being critical thinkers. And so that's a, a form of laziness, slothfulness, which God does not, is not pleased. But in certain cultures, this is looked upon as frowned upon. A characteristic of slothfulness, by and large, explain the differences between the cultures. It's important that we educate our children, mothers and fathers, to be industrious. This is a good trait. So this woman is just the opposite. She is capable, physically able. She's business smart and prosperous. So I read real quick in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 13. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house and not merely idle, but also gossips and busy bodies talking about things not proper to mention. That's where 1 Timothy chapter 5 and 13 is speaking of these women that they get to idle, idleness. And um, I think it was... Um, my mom said idle hands belong to the devil or something like that. I remember she used to tell us, get busy, don't stay idle. Titus 2 and 3, chapter 2, verses 3 to 5 says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, Workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husband, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So the godly woman is industrious. And I'm going to jump on to another, uh, another character trait. Number two, she's prudent. Um, chapter 19, verse 14, 14 says, house and wealth are, in, are an inheritance from fathers. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. And it says, in, contract to a la in contrast to a lazy wife, who is often unprepared, sloppy, not thinking ahead, characterized by excuses and overall lack in excellence. Prudence. And there's another Hebrew word I found, sakal, S-A-K-A-L, means wisdom. So prudence is be wise. 
shown in the exercise of reason, forethought, and self-control. So Sakal, we're going to apply Sakal, sisters and brothers. Sakal is wisdom. How to exercise self-control and forethought. Think before we act or speak. So a godly woman pushes herself. She uses her mind to think ahead and she gets ready. And I found six Ps. So she's prepared, six Ps. Six P.S. Peters, six of them. So her proper prior planning is a preventative poor, is to prevent poor performance. So I read it again. What a, a godly woman will do is she uses her mind to think ahead to get ready. So it's proper, prior, planning, preventative, poor performance, to prevent poor performance. So quality is only inbred from above. These are things that give from the Lord. The Lord wants us to be that way, prudent, prepared. Number three, she's wise and understanding. Uh, chapter 24, verses 3 to 4, by wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with the precious, all precious and pleasant riches. The Bible says the primary role of a wife in marriage is to build and establish the home while the husband works outside as the breadwinner. And you'll find that in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. But whereas both are of similar value before God and society, both mom and dad are very valuable because what? They function in different capacities, but they team up to build the kingdom, their country, and the next generations. So it takes a husband and wife, ideally, to build a better community, a better society. So this is how God made marriages, but I'm going to move down to our character trait number four. She cares for the poor. And verse chapter 31, which is where we're starting from, verses 19 to 20, she stretches, it says, her hands to the, the staff and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. A godly woman is selfless. Not only does she care for her husband and her own children, investing far more time in them than being self-absorbed in trivial events. So today we all can get involved in so many little things that are not have nothing to do with the service of God and commitment to our children and family. <clears throat> but in addition, she cares for the poor and the needy. So I fifth character trait is she has class. She's classy. And, verse 30, and chapter 31, verses 21, 22, she's not afraid of the show of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet, mm. with scarlet. She makes covering for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. I remember my mom taught us to sew. My mom was the belief that you must learn to sew, cook, clean, wash, all these things, and take care of family. So that's how we were raised. And I learned to sew as a little girl very early on. My mom used to show me how to cut patterns. It was a passion of mine. I lost it somewhere along the line. I still have it. But I want us to know that because that's what we, uh, I know economics, these things are taught in the home and, and to cook and to take care of things. And this is godly. This is not just all because you're a woman, but everyone should know how to do this. But a godly woman does not dress in an ungodly, suggestive, uh, a slipshod manner. Her outer adornment reflects her inner demeanor. Isn't that nice? And verse 30, 17 says she girds herself with strength and make her arms strong. So she's not only that pretty outside, but she's also a woman of strength. And it shows. So 25 says strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. She's very... She's very uh, positive. She dresses with dignity, meaning she gives thought and care for the occasion. And in view of her husband's position, a king, she's not distracted, okay? Because that's important that we don't dress in a way where our eyes are taken, somebody's eyes is wandering, uh, wander off and distracts because that is important that a godly trait, that a woman that is a virtuous woman goes in 
and knows how to not distract with her appearance. She's industrious and she has good stewards of her resources. And it goes on. And um, so I'm going to another character trait. She's kind. And we see that in verse 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. So kindness, I found another Hebrew word, which is kes, K-E-S-E-D, kes. It's a rich Hebrew word denoting deeds of devotion, favor and loveliness. That's what that word, kindness, is a person who do the deeds, the working, because of the favor that we have and because the inner loveliness that we carry, it compels us to do kindness. So this carries the Old Testament idea into the New Testament word of love, which is agape, meaning unchanging, unconditional, graciousness, agape. It means graciousness, unchanging, unconditional. So this woman, her speech is flavored with tenderness and mercy. Wow, I, this is amazing, yeah. Others enjoy talking to her for endless hours. She's not rigid or legalistic, full of self, harsh or gossipy. She's kind and gracious in speech. Wow, I wanna be her, yeah. She's trustworthy and that's her, I believe her last trait I found. She's trustworthy and in the same chapter 31 verses 11 to 12, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all days of her life. Got to be careful, right? That even as we, our intentions, our intentions should be always to do good. So a woman, she, a woman that is good partner to her husband will ensure her success. That's a good woman. When you want your husband to succeed, whatever he's doing or, you know, you, he's doing it because of this love for his family. He wants to be encouraged. So if he's called to public service or to be a leader in the church and her children and will be this, they will also strive to do so because they see what she's doing to support her family or husband. So how to locate a great woman and what to, and what to do when you find her now? Because if you find her, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Favor, right? So, wow. God says, if you find a good wife, you find a good thing, but also I give you favor. And notice the results of when you find a good wife, a good thing. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. In other words, you treat your wife with all the care because you found a good thing and you got favor. And also you're known, well known in the gates. So she, um, when he sits among the elders of the land. So now the suggestion is, right? Husbands, this is you, husbands, lavish a great woman. You'll find a great woman, lavish her. Once, she, once one has learned the characteristic of a good wife located and, a mar and you marry her, he best take care of her, take care of your wife, lavish her with excellent, with, with, with love, with attention, and give her more of everything than desired. Don't be stingy with your love, with your attention, husband. Don't be stingy because a woman wants, she will give you all she has, her love, her heart, who she is, if you just shower her and lavish her with the attention. You don't have to be jewelry and gold and sit all that, but just the love. And so, and you should never stop doing what agreed to when you got married, you took a vow. And so continue to do that. She's worthy of honor. When you find a good wife, give her honor. A gracious woman attains honor and ruthless men attain riches. In verse chapter 11, 16 says, verse chapter 12, 4 says, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. We read that before. And um, so, Verse chapter 31, 10 says, so who can find an excellent wife for her work is far above jewels. So she's worthy of praise. I have one more thing you do when you find a good wife. In chapter 31, verses 28, 29, her children rise up and bless her. 
her husband also. And he praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. So here you go, lavish her with praise. So now look out for the not so great eight, okay? Women in the Bible. These are some characters, traits that I found that in these women, um, the Bible's full of other, other women that they, they have all kinds of dishonorable behaviors. And scripture teaches us that women should not be like that. For instance, I found the licentious women. Like the woman at the well in John chapter four, remember her? Prior to her conversion to Christ, licentious women are those who lack moral discipline or sexual restraint. This kind of woman is paraded in Proverbs more so than any other, <laughs> any other woman, the one that is uh, unrestrained, perhaps because she's so dangerous to the office of the holders, to, to those that in, in, in public office. So licentious people, be they male or female, destroy marriages. Adultery is one of their surest ways to instantly and forever destroy a great marriage. Notice how Solomon hammers away on sexual temptation as he relate to those in authority. So if you're a man of God in the church, if you're a man in public service, a king, a priest, a president, you must shun this. The Bible says shun the very appearance of evil. Shun this kind of a, 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 a woman, the licentious type, even men. And then you have the deceivable woman. In chapter 2, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it states, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Deceive is another, uh, I found another word. Um, Jew, Hebrew word, exapatao, exapatao. I think this is a Greek word, really. And it means to seduce wholly, to persuade into disobedience. Eve is an example of a woman who was persuadable to do wrong. She did not possess personal spiritual fortitude. Accordingly, when away by herself, she was vulnerable. Is your fate your own? Are you able to practice self-control? Are you vulnerable when you find yourself in different situations where your faith, you have to stand for what you believe in, believe in, or you're persuadable? Be careful. Let's be careful, women of God and men of God, that we are not easily persuaded to do what's wrong. And then there's a third character, a third woman, the materialistic woman. And Genesis 19, 26 speaks of this woman is regarding Lot's wife. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Earlier in verse 17, Lot and his family escaped the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. You may remember the story. And the angel, the angel told him specifically, do not look back. <laughs> it seemed like a small thing at the time. But it it's, was an order. And many times... We hear from God, he says, leave that behind, leave it alone, leave it there. Just move forward and keep, walk, keep going. There is a reason because sometimes we, oh, let me go back and get this. Oh, I need this, I can't leave this. And, and sometimes it's just material things that can be replaced. And God is taking us to another place where he wants us to leave those things behind. So let's, um, so this ties over. In the New Testament, in Luke chapter 17, verses 29, 33 says, are you heavenly minded or are you attached to the material things of this world? Seek first the kingdom of God, he says, and all his righteousness and all these other things shall be added on to us. Amen. So we have number four, contentious woman. They talk about a lot about this woman in the Bible. They said that's a spirit that most women have. And it's fine, prevalent to be in the Bible. They find a lot of these women. But here we are, um, I use, I found this is a woman who's obstinate and argumentative and relenting. She's unrelenting and irritating. And she irritates. So we talk, they found King Saul gave his daughter Michal to David to be his wife. Laid him and with, so Second Samuel, Chapter six, verse 20 records, but one incident of her lack of respect for her husband. 
how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. Mishal is illustrative of a contentious woman. Proverbs has much more to say about this. The Hebrew word contentious is madon, M-A-D-O-N, madon. Appears in each of these Proverbs, believe it or not. Solomon states, he states it twice, it emphasis. That is a woman you must avoid. You must not be, that's a character trait. It means an often perverse and wearisome tendency to quarrel and dispute. Not only are you driving your husband crazy, but you're hurting the corporate witness, witness of the body of Christ. And there's some scriptures here. I'm going to breeze through it because time. And chapter 21, 19 said, it's better to live in a desert land than with a contentions of vexing women. And another scripture says, um, chapter 25, it is better to live in a corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Wow. And chapter 27, verse 15 and 16 says, a constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. He who will restrain her restrains the wind and a grasp oil with his right hand. She's just constantly going, slipping, slipping. So dripping. And that is the character trait that we want to avoid, even of men and women. And then you have, it's eight of them. So I'm going to go through the number five. She's a corrupting woman. And this is in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 31. Israel King Ahab marries Jezebel, hmm, the daughter of the king of the Sidonites, who were Baal worshipers. Needless to say, Ahab made a huge mistake. Jezebel illustrates a woman who corrupts others, leading her husband and others astray, as we could see it in 1 Kings chapter 21, 25. She's a leading contender for the greatest of the not-so-greats. She was one of the not-so-greats. Jezebel, everybody knows her name. Hmm. So you have the discouraging women, the uh, verse uh, 6 trait. A sixth character, in the midst of life downturn, some women fall apart. They can't handle the pressure. Lacking endurance in the midst of a trial, they reason incorrectly. <laughs> they will say, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for this. This is a not so great, like Job's wife. They're talking about Job's wife, I believe, when she was like telling Job to curse God and die. She's like, I didn't sign up for all this suffering, but this is a discouraging woman that we don't want to be. So she states in every way her husband, when Job, when he, she told her, curse God and die. We don't want to be that. So you have the manipulative woman. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 3 and 8, Herodias, she seduces her husband's brother in order to get her way. In this case, that meant the head of John the Baptist. And Proverbs 31, 10 states, it states it well, it says, charm is deceitful. Charm is deceitful. Be on the lookout. Some women are, are masters at using their powers to get their way. Don't be among them. And then we have the deceitful woman. We are talking about Sapphira. Remember Ananias and Sapphira, the husband and the wife? <laughs> and so she's a deceived. She, um, where evil was, he says, where he was deceivable, Sapphira was the deceitful one. He was duped into doing things. But Sapphira is the one who came up with in Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, the story goes. And she um, lied. She deceived when she was asked. So when she was, and, and she could have said, well, we didn't have the, the monies and stuff, but she chose to lie. So be careful. Don't be a woman who makes a career out of acting. Sapphira. So lastly, about great women. When it comes to the future of the world, women, are way more important than men. In that sense, not that we are more important because even now it's war is going on as a man of Star Wars, God forbid. But we wanna say that women are more important, why? 
because God charges wives with the primary responsibility of raising up the next generation. And apart from nurturing a godly heritage, there will be no tomorrow for our world. The investment of a godly woman pay the greatest dividends to society. What a high calling, huh? So praise God for his design. He has designed us, brothers and sisters. He has designed women to be the carriers, to be the supporters, the nurturers, the one who keeps the home together, family together. So I want us to be encouraged as women that our task, the calling that is placed on us is a high calling, it's straight from above. And maybe we can't be like the virtuous woman in everything, but we can strive to be more Christ-like. And let's pursue and persevere in this walk with Christ as we all come alongside and help each other up. If you see me falling, if you see me faltering, pick me up and help me out and I will do the same for you. I need you and you need me. We need each other. We need to run this race together, brethren. This is the race we need to run. So let's pray. Father, if there is anyone that has heard this message or this word or this teaching and are struggling with any of the character traits, deceit, any one of these character traits that are not pleasing to you, lies, God, acting, pretending, the things that we see, God, to get our ways. Father, I pray that even as a man, God, that this will not be found amongst us, not manipulation, not discouraging one another, not corrupting each at the situations and around us. Father, I pray that we will not be contentious people that are argumentative, obstinate, unrelenting. Remove all these traits that are not of you, I pray tonight, God, and replace it with the fruit of the Spirit, oh God, that are joy, peace, love, long-suffering, oh God, gratefulness, thankfulness, faithfulness. Oh God, I thank you that you are replacing Everything that is not of us and not of you, not of your spirit, oh God, you're replacing it with these things that you want us to be more like you, God. So help us as we go. And for those that don't know you, I said, Lord, touch someone who accidentally watched this video. And I ask you that you, oh God, will transform them and that you will enter into their heart, that they will come in, that you, they will let you in and that their lives will be changed. And I thank you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. And I want to thank each and everyone that had the chance to listen. And I pray that it was a blessing. It was a blessing to me because I learned. Amen. God bless you. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake together, and running over. So you know what time it is? It's time for you to give. And in order to do that, all you need to do is go to our church's website. Go to www.fgany.org. That's www.fgany.org. And when you get to the webpage, all you have to do is click give and it will open up where you'd be able to pay your tithe, your offering, or give to any special ministry that you would normally give to. So don't forget, go to www.fgany.org and give.